So, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as usual, this is uh, my uh, pleasure to be here in India and uh, have the opportunity to visit your countries, uh, in fact, a lot of times uh, during uh, these last years. And uh, it will continue because, uh, as I'm going to explain to you, we have uh, a number of uh, projects uh, with India. And uh, the first point on which uh, I want to insist is that, uh, that in fact, uh, we are two space nations, uh, India and France. Because uh, you know that uh, I attended the first uh, space policy dialogue uh, meeting with great interest. And uh, when I was invited this year, I was very keen to come to speak to you because space cooperation between uh, India and France is at its zenith. President Macron, who is uh, the youngest uh, president uh, of France, he just uh, passed uh, his uh, 40th anniversary a few weeks ago. President Macron will be here uh, in Delhi in uh, less than a month's time. And the space will be very, very high on the agenda of the visit. And as a matter of fact, uh, we'll have a number of meetings this afternoon and I uh, just ended this morning. This afternoon and uh, tomorrow before flying back to France to prepare this, uh, this visit. Our two nations share uh, similar views on space, be it through our mutual dedication to developing a strong and independent space program, our positioning as a comprehensive space agencies with world-class technical expertise in the same fields of interest, or our long-standing tradition of visionary engineering. For all these reasons, we have achieved many, many successes together and built up a close and trusting relationship over the decades. As it has been uh, reminded a few minutes ago, CNES is quite uh, well known here in India, but uh, I would like uh, just briefly recall that uh, with a budget uh, for space of 2.5 billion euros every year, France spends the second highest amount of space per capita in the world. 80% for fifth of our uh, budget returns to French industry via contracts, and uh, France accounts for more than uh, 40% of all European jobs and uh, all European space jobs, and CNES also plays a leading role at European level. We are the main contributor of the European Space Agency, ESA, and my colleague from Portugal spoke about that a few minutes ago. I have the honor of chairing uh, the ESA Council. As you, say, as you know, ESA consists of uh, 22 member states, providing a global budget of 5.5 billion euros. And in addition, CNES is also closely involved in the space program conducted by the European Union, and uh, we are playing an active role in the Galileo satellite uh, navigation system. You know Galileo, Galileo is uh, European GPS, and I am sure that in a couple of years, we will say that the uh, GPS is the uh, US Galileo. You will see. But uh, uh, we are playing an active role in the Galileo satellite navigation system and in the Copernicus program and its uh, Sentinel series of satellites. I would like to just to say a few words about uh, our domain of activity. We have uh, five domains of activity. Ariane launchers to guarantee Europe's independent access to space. And uh, we have been entrusted by INDA to launch uh, almost 20 uh, Indian satellites from uh, French Guiana. Science with uh, outstanding successes like the Rosetta Philae mission to uh, the comet uh, shurimov gerasimenko Earth observation to provide the crucial data for research, operational services, and climate. Telecommunication for uh, connectivity, positioning, and search and rescue. And last but uh, not least, defense with uh, high resolution observation, intelligence gathering, and uh, secure telecommunications. A point on which uh, I want to insist is that uh, innovation and uh, international cooperation underpin everything we do. By showing cost and pooling talents, international cooperation shortens development cycles and enables the most ambitious projects. And by cultivating contact with other cultures and methods, it encourages the descriptive approaches needed to stay competitive. 
Now, a few words about the France-India cooperation. ISRO clearly, clearly stands out among our non-European international partners. With ISRO, we have put together a fleet of satellites for climate monitoring for space. The Megatropic and Saral Altica satellites that uh, we launched together in uh, 2011 and 2013, Megatropic and Saral Altica are providing precious data for uh, research and operational applications like monsoon forecasting, food security, and water resource management. The Ocean 3 satellite to be launched later this year will carry a French Argos payload, and we have started development of a future joint state of the art infrared satellite heralding new prospects. But more is on the way, and uh, you will learn about that in a few weeks, because uh, we are also working with uh, ISRO on plans for France to participate in India's future planetary exploration missions. Worldwide cooperation, it's uh, very important and the CNES is also working with many other international partners in space. With NASA, we recently celebrated the 25 years of operational services in oceanography, while SWAT, the future joint NASA mission, CNES NASA mission is set to measure surface water aids using a very innovative radar technology. And we are on Mars with curiosity since uh, 2012, 6 of August 2012. And in the future, with InSight, we are going to launch InSight with NASA on the 5th of May from Vandenberg in California to hear the nose of the art of Mars because <coughs> InSight is a seismometer. We will be on Mars 2020, which will be launched in uh, 2020, with new players in the field like Israel, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, South Korea, Australia, South Africa. We have entered into very promising joint developments, and uh, with uh, traditional players like uh, Russia and Japan, we keep permanent contact and explore synergies whenever possible. <coughs> Back in Europe, <coughs> we are developing Merlin, a French-German mission focusing on methane emissions and microcarb with the United Kingdom to measure the dynamics of carbon dioxide. We will also fly this year to Mercury with uh, ISA Bepi Colombo cornerstone mission. Now a point which is very, very important for me is tackling climate change. Because the CNES is today essentially a climate-driven agency. Space has potential as a tool for keeping track of climate change is being turbocharged by the digital revolution. Satellite systems provide by far the highest amount of data for climate models. Space is the one and only global and permanent observatory available and 26 of the 50 essential climate variables can only be measured by satellite. 26 over 50 is more than half. In-depth understanding of the water cycles and sustainable management of the world's water resources are both highly dependent on space-based monitoring. And to reach the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it has been signed on the 12th of December 2015, we need first to precisely and dependent map what is being emitted, and this is exactly what satellites can do. And this is why this emerging but uh, vital challenge has led to a unique convergence of priorities for public space investments worldwide. Governments have urged their space agencies to concentrate their efforts on satellites dedicated to climate monitoring especially to map greenhouse gas emissions. ISRO and CNES chose to take this path long ago, as we have been developing climate monitoring satellites together for more than 15 years. Both agencies were also the instigators of what we call the New Delhi Declaration, in which more than 60 space agencies, as you said, from all the world's world advocated in 2016 an international pooling of space emissions. 
But the effort continue last year because the climate monitoring was also the key issue at the recent One Planet Summit, which has been hosted in Paris by President Macron. And the CNES took the initiative to invite the international space community on this occasion to discuss the inception of a space climate observatory. Indeed, tackling climate change is the biggest challenge space is facing today, even if public awareness of this is still lagging somewhat. For the first time, our economies and our societies are in fact depending on space to survive. This challenge might well be the greatest we have ever faced in the history of astronautics. And I want to make very, very clear today that climate monitoring has rapidly become an essential duty for us as space agencies. Until now, space agencies' core task was to guarantee independent access to space for the national military. While this is still the case, the climate challenge gives a tremendous new boost to our very existence as public players in space. I would like now to address the positioning of the traditional space agencies in the step change we are seeing today. Space is becoming just another big infrastructure sector in the global economy, much closer to users than it ever was before with both public and private players. Investors now see a level playing field unlike when government funding was involved. Space agencies has always served as technology catalysts with innovation as a guiding thread. We invest where there are no margins in areas where industry would typically not call on private funds. Over the years, we have proven successful in many respects to enable the development of cutting edge technologies that industry needed to stay competitive. But the game is not over because uh, our traditional Pathfinder role is now being boosted with the rise of what is so-called new space players. CNES has established partnerships with national and international startups and acts as a mentor, providing technical expertise, engineering support, testing capacities and control systems, the kind of things that new entrants to space urgently need. Most of these new players do not have the investment capacity they need nor do they benefit from a strong market base for the space applications they are seeking to develop. On our side, developing applications and services remains integral. As space usage has reached all sectors of our societies, CNES has established strong ties to space user communities all over the world, as ISRO has done here in India. But in fact, to be very honest, uh, what is new today is that uh, following a path taken by other technologies in history, space is posed to reach the widest possible number. With uh, thousands of new private players and dozens of new nations making their first foray into space, and the number of new users growing at exponential rates, we are seeing a paradigm <coughs> shift that is bringing with it, disruptive approaches and challenging methods. It is definitely exciting to be part of this. At CNES, we immediately grasped the chance and adapted rapidly by capitalizing on the strong connections we have to the mobility, energy, insurance, fisheries, agriculture, construction, and security sectors to lay the foundation of a network of users on which space businesses will come to rely in the future. This, is com this new company, in fact, will not survive indefinitely without government support. As we want them to succeed, we must support them in the years ahead. This new blood is also a fantastic chance for us traditional players. As space agencies, we have been driven by innovation over the past decades, but our new space partners are today bringing short-term cycles simplified systems 
and lower cost structures. We are having to adapt and become as agile and flexible as they are, embracing new methods and hence making more efficient use of public funding. In India, we are exchanging on a regular basis with uh, several Indian new space players. And we have uh, signed the partnerships agreements with some of them. We are working closely with Astrom, Bellatrix, SatSearch, Earth2Orbit, and Timendus, to name just a few. We are supporting this promising newcomers since our vision is to bring the French and Indian community together, thus enabling both ecosystems to reach critical mass. In France, we are very keen to support the Make in India and Digital India initiatives. We know Antrix is thinking of similar incubator solutions to those we are implementing, and uh, my personal belief is that in joining forces once again to, succeed, to, su to, to sustain our successful ISRO NES partnership, but this time for new space, France and India could multiply their chances of success with great benefits for both space communities. To conclude, I would like uh, to share some uh, key ideas we should uh, keep in mind when looking to forge the future of space. International cooperation <coughs> and freely available data have from the early days been the general rule in the space community, long before these concepts reached other sectors of activity. This global essence of space and the spirit of universality must always inspire what we do. Second, I think that uh, we have to realize that the revolutions in IT and transportation that uh, have made the world a smaller place were not too only enabled by the internet, as usually reported, but also by satellites. Like our sister organization, ISRO, we have been fully part of this. CNES and ISRO are more than ever pivotal players in the revolutions now unfolding, since our two nations are increasing looking to co-develop new space technologies. Lastly, far from uh, being swept from the table, traditional players gained new chances in this mode. The price of getting into space might have come down, but space is still a very, very difficult uh, high-end technology and they have work, which uh, is requiring public involvement in many years. By having new players join forces with uh, us traditional agencies, we can achieve the best of both worlds, maturing a symbiotic relationship uh, in which each side feeds from the other. Indeed, it is in the spirit of uh, what I so-called the symbiosis that uh, we will invent the future of space. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gall, for that uh, very innovating address. And you spoke at great length about uh, you know, collaborations across countries, collaborations across various players who are now entering this space. Uh, now, before I open this uh, for discussions and some questions from the audience, which you've kindly agreed to, uh, I have two short questions, which are really, really, really one question related to uh, some happenings around us. The first is, you know, that uh, is Brexit. Britain stepping out of the European Union. And you have the Copernicus programs, you have the Galileo programs, you have the Neosat programs. Uh, now, are you seeing that there could be, uh, you've spoken about collaborations across countries, would there be separate arrangements with the ESA that could take place? No, uh, UK is stepping up from the European Union, but the UK stays into Europe. And it's uh, very important because the European Space Agency is an intergovernmental agency and it is not a part of the European Union. So it means that uh, UK will continue to be a key partner of the European Agency in terms of budget. Uh, UK is uh, the number three after France, Germany. We have the UK in front of Italy. And uh, uh, on uh, Copernicus and uh, Galileo, for the part which is developed uh, in uh, ESA, UK will continue. 
For the part which is in the European Union, of course, uh, we have uh, what we uh, so-called uh, Article 50, and we are working on that to uh, find a way to uh, put the uh, UK in the new organization. To say that uh, we spent a lot of time to build Europe. People uh, in UK decided to vote for Brexit, so we have to adapt. But globally, I think uh, that uh, even if uh, there are some uh, specific points which uh, will be changed, globally, the uh, wish of uh, UK to continue to be a very prominent uh, space player will continue. And what do you see the future of the International Space Station after 2025? Uh, do you see more private sector players coming in with NASA stepping out or saying it will not fund it? We hear the same thing uh, every year. But uh, my personal feeling is uh, that uh, till, uh, as, as far as the space station will uh, function properly, it will continue, it will continue to be uh, managed and uh, the transfer of uh, public funding to uh, private funding uh, seems to be uh, not so easy because uh, today the budget uh, coming from NASA uh, to the space station is uh, several billion dollars and uh, I am not sure that uh, there is a business case allowing uh, the private sector to invest every year several billion dollars. So there is a global move, but uh, we have to be uh, very cautious because when people explain that now private companies have replaced government agencies, if we take uh, some uh, very well-known uh, examples in the US in particular, SpaceX, we speak a lot about SpaceX, but most of the revenues of SpaceX come from NASA or the DOD. So these are private companies working with uh, public funding, and perhaps uh, that for the station we will have the same, private companies investing money in the space station within the frame of a contract uh, with NASA. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for those uh, answers. Uh, now I'm opening the floor for questions. Uh, we'll collect a few questions. Uh, yes, there's one right back there. And could you also please introduce yourself while you ask a question? Good afternoon. Uh, this is Pratip Basu. I'm a uh, founder of a startup called uh, Satshirt. Um, my question to uh, yourself, sir, would be, uh, Kenes has been, uh, uh, Kenes has probably the largest data of uh, database of Earth observation satellite after USGS, which is Landsat. And the uh, satellite I'm speaking about is the spot series data. So uh, with the European Commission opening up uh, data sets uh, from Sentinel, uh, do you see uh, potential for developing applications jointly with the kind of com like collaborations that you're building, which you spoke about, uh, which can be not only developed for France, but can become a model of how uh, space agencies uh, collaborate uh, with international and domestic pri private players to uh, valorize the uh, space assets uh, on which so much money is spent. It's an excellent question. And uh, for me, uh, since the beginning, uh, since uh, we receive data coming from space, I've been always convinced that uh, the only way to increase the number of space players is to get a free access to this data. Because in my opinion, why, how, how do you uh, measure the success of a program? The success of a program, in my opinion, is the number of users. And so if you have a free access to the data, and this is exactly what we started to do in France in CNES with a platform so-called PEPS, and now, in Europe, it is the same with DIAS. There is a free access to uh, Sentinel data. And it's very, very important, in my opinion, because we have a development of many startups using this data everywhere in the world, starting with Europe, of course. There are some people in Europe saying, but uh, are you crazy? Because with free access of data, you are going to allow uh, startups uh, in uh, California, in China, perhaps in India, to develop uh, systems with the money of the European taxpayer. 
But I think that it is exactly what we must do. Because if we have these systems, if we want this system to be successful, they have to be used. And uh, it's my opinion, it's uh, really a very good objective, an excellent objective to have uh, a lot of applications worldwide of data which are provided by uh, European satellites. And uh, we want to go one step further in the field of climate. I spoke in my speech about the Space Climate Observatory, and this is exactly what we want to do. The Space Climate Observatory is a kind of hub where all the scientists worldwide will find all the data which are delivered by satellites worldwide. And it is not just a concept. I think that uh, it's the only way to have a, re a, a global coverage about uh, climate change data and uh, to develop really a fight against uh, climate change. Thank you, sir. Merci. Uh, Daniel Porras de les Nations Unies, monsieur. Uh, je, le, je le remercie pour votre mot. Uh, just a, a quick question. We've heard a, a lot of discussion today about the need for India to um, have greater uh, human resources here uh, within the country. Uh, do you have any suggestions for emerging actors or, or even established players such as India to uh, further encourage young people uh, to develop the expertise in science, technology, um, and, and other science-related um, activities? My opinion uh, today if you look uh, worldwide, why, what are the topics which uh, are of interest for uh, people involved in space, but which are also interested for young generations? We have innovation, because uh, everyone is uh, very, very surprised by uh, innovation in the field of technology. People. Uh, like to have new objects, new uh, piece of technology, smartphone. People are, in the beginning, are probably more interesting in having a real piece of technology in their hands than to develop applications. So, first point, innovation. Uh, second point, uh, climate, because climate change, everyone speaks about climate change, and in particular here in India with the monsoon and so on. And third point, which is, in my opinion, very important, is exploration. And exploration, we have a number of missions uh, in front of us. Mars, in my opinion, is key for uh, exploration because we know that the life has been possible on Mars. The question is, uh, life in the past, uh, did, we, uh, uh, did we have uh, uh, life uh, on Mars? And it's very, very uh, exciting for young generation. And if you speak about uh, Mars, to young generations are very excited. And uh, I was uh, in India uh, a few years ago when uh, Mangalyan uh, was launched uh, to Mars, first Chandrayaan to the moon, but Mangalyan to Mars. It's really, really excited because there are not so many uh, probes in orbit of Mars. Uh, today, uh, the US, uh, there is Mangalya from India, and uh, there are two European probes, uh, uh, Mars Express that we launched in uh, 2003, and uh, ExoMars that we launched in 2016. A lot are coming. Uh, I spoke about Insight that it will launch on the 5th of May. In 2020, we will have five uh, probes, uh, Mangalyan 2, uh, one from China, uh, ExoMars between Europe and uh, Russia, Mars 2020. And even in the Emirates, they will launch a probe because they consider that uh, for a small country as the Emirates, of course, with a lot of money, but they consider that uh, having uh, such uh, uh, a probe in orbit of Mars is uh, a fantastic accelerator for uh, young generations and for uh, uh, the interest of young generations for technology and space. Uh, well, I know there are more questions, but uh, I've been given 4.30 as a Cinderella hour, so I'm going to stop it. Uh, Dr. Gall has a meeting to attend, so thank you very much, Dr. Gall, for being with us. And um, we've been having this dialogue for the you know, last, this is the fourth dialogue. We've continued to hope to have it every year. Uh, this is an ongoing process. It's been a pleasure having you with us. And I do look forward to the CNES uh, becoming a partner in this dialogue with us and carrying it over because this is one central dialogue which addresses uh, a lot of policy concerns within 
India about what is happening in the space sector. So a very warm welcome, and thank you to you, sir, for being with us. Thank you.